Michigan State moves to two and two on the season. Minnesota completely pants them at their home. Let's just let's just get to the show. Our locked on Spartans, your daily podcast on the Michigan State Spartans, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hey, Spartan friends, Spartan family, um, even the haters. I know you guys are here. Why wouldn't you be here? The team that you can't beat for the last two years and the coach that has owned you in his short tenure uh, looks like a JV team. I- I'd be here too if I was in your situation. Anyway, welcome to Locked on Spartans. That's right, your team every single day. And hey, first and foremost, I would like to thank LinkedIn Jobs for being the official college football recruiting sponsor across the Locked On College Network. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash Locked On College. Terms and conditions apply. That's right, Scotty Hazelton. LinkedIn might be helping you at your next stop. Who's to say where that's going to be? Maybe not even a football field. Anyway, uh, we got a lot to talk about on today's show. Michigan State, allegedly uh, attempted to play another football game on Saturday. And I'm not even sure if I can be convinced of that either. Uh, But before getting into the uh, post-mortem of that game, hey, please rate, review, and subscribe here to this podcast and YouTube show. Yes, this is Locked on Spartans, your team every single day, whether you like it or not. So let's get into the show here. Um, God, just shades of 2016 Wisconsin, right? Um, where it's home, you didn't lose, you got flat out embarrassed, and you're looking down the road and wondering, uh oh, is this is this really what we are this season? And spoiler alert, I'm afraid so. Uh, we will get into it, of course, but look, I I want to start with the silver linings of today's game, and you might think that's just complete and total nonsense, but hey, there's not a lot of them. So let's just get them out of the way right now. The, the good things of losing 34-7 to against Minnesota of the Big Ten West, not, not, not Georgia, uh, not Alabama, nope, not, not Clemson, nope, just Minnesota. Um, so the silver linings is that uh, look, we can actually look back now and really appreciate that we watched the greatest college football player of all time last year in Kenneth Walker. We all, we all thought that he was just the best running back in the nation last year. He might be the greatest college football player ever to hide all the blemishes that Michigan State had, whether it be the offensive line, which we will get to, the play calling, which we will get to, the defense being just horrible, which we will get to. He was able to erase all of that just by himself. So, yes, hey, everyone says, well, he should have won the Heisman. The, the dude should have won a, a Purple Heart, Nobel Peace Prize, Medal of Freedom, uh, probably a Pulitzer. He deserves every award for his efforts last year. Silver lining number two. Once again, just like last week, it was a quick game. The game was over in under an hour of real time. We can all just get on with the rest of our lives if you're a sane person. I'm not. I stuck around and watched the whole game for the most part. But hey, if you're a well-functioning adult and you care about your uh, well-being, you were able to just leave at halftime and not worry about missing anything. No fumbles, no, uh, you know, more third down conversions. Now you were able to enjoy the rest of your Saturday. So thank you, Mel Tucker and company. Another game that was over just like that on a Saturday. Uh, Silver lining number three, you you might not have to budget for any bowl game travels this year, and we'll get more into that. Maybe I'm just uh, reacting a little too much. Maybe I'm a prisoner of the moment, but we're going to get to that in a hot second. Uh, another silver lining number four is that I was actually able to laugh a lot at halftime when PJ Fleck told the uh, halftime reporter that, uh, Hey, we've got to come out because we're playing a really good football team. (laughs) PJ, what? Like give PJ Fleck the Emmy for saying that with a straight face. And, uh, Hey, silver lining number five is that unfortunately we got a lot of answers about this team. Uh, and the first answer first and foremost is that no, what happened last weekend at Seattle wasn't just, hey, Washington's a good team. Maybe they still are, but no, that, that's not the whole story of what happened last week. And unfortunately, Michigan State just isn't one. And again, hey, maybe I'm prisoner of the moment. Like, oh, hey, Minnesota's a good team. They might win the West. Wow, they might win the Big Ten West. All right. Ooh, maybe we can schedule who's going to win the MAC next year. Like, please. Yeah, they're a fine team. 
but you're supposed to be a fine team. The coach that's making nine and a half million dollars is supposed to be coaching a good team. The team that just came off an 11 win season and wants to convince the world that no, it wasn't just one guy in Kenneth Walker. They're supposed to be a good team, but they're not because a lot of the issues from last year are carrying over. Now, look, we're going to talk about the game a little bit from a micro level, but just I, I can't talk about this game to start the show here because it's more than just about the game. It, it's the way they lost. And now you're sitting at two and two. And I'll be honest, look, you know me, I'm a sick person. I think a lot about our Michigan State Spartans. And before the season, I'm playing a lot of scenarios in my head. Did I see two and two ever being a scenario that, yes, you win against Western, you win against Akron, then you drop Washington and Minnesota? Sure. Yeah, I, there were some scenarios where I thought that would happen. However, never, never, ever, ever did it cross my mind that it'd be two and two this way. Oh, yeah, beating Western and Akron, getting punked at Washington, which, hey, a good team. Okay, on the road, tough environment. But then turning around and getting pantsed on Big Ten Network in front of your home fans in another game that was over really before it even started, that never did I envision that that could happen. A 2-2 two and two record where you look that awful. And now we got to go on to the bigger picture here. And here's a funny thing. It, 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 actually, it's not really that funny at all, is that, hey, I'm – I'm the podcast host. I'm the YouTube host. I've been doing this for a while. Talk about Michigan State. I'm supposed to be articulate, you know, really have thoughts written down really well. I don't really right now because I, I'm torn mentally between what I think about what's happening from a broad perspective. No, listen, the, the season uh, is probably going to be toast here uh, if, if it's not already toast, but just the future. Look, we're coming off of not an offseason, but late in the season last year where Mel Tucker signed that mega contract, 10 years, $95 million, uh, $9.5 million per season, getting paid like a big boy coach. And here is where I'm torn, and this isn't going to make a lot of sense, but let me just try my best, is that on one hand, I, I still do believe in the Mel Tucker era. Like, I know that there's a lot of reactions flying around that, like, oh, he got $100 million, and it's the biggest waste of money. He doesn't know what he's doing, this, this, and I, I still believe that Mel Tucker is the right guy for this job. I want to get out in front of that right now. Now, is he completely absolved of everything? Well, listen to the rest of this podcast and you can make conclusions yourself. But yes, it, this is a really bad start to the season. But we're talking about a guy who has SEC chops. I think he knows that he cannot stand for this. I think he will be moving and shaking the coaching staff after the season, if not maybe even sooner if this continues. But also, hey, I look, a lot of the issues here today were – who was on the field. And that's mean. Yeah, I'm talking about college kids trying their very best, but hey, at the end of the day, like we got to call a spade a spade here. And some of the kids aren't up to snuff and who's going to help get us out of that is Mel Tucker with his recruiting. Now his oldest recruits so far are only sophomores or redshirt freshmen, maybe still a little too young to make an impact, but Hey, okay. Now we're going to go to the other hand where I'm starting to wonder, um, wow. These aren't just losses you had in the last two weekends. These are certified embarrassments. Uh, and, hey, we all have the debate, like, oh, is it the players? Is it the scheme? Is it the transfer portal? Is it this, this? When it's this bad, when it's this bad, 34-7 to loss at home against Minnesota, it's on everyone. It is on everyone. It's on the players. It's on the coaching staff. It's on the, the personnel. It's on everything. It's... So when you look at it, uh-oh, who's at the top? It's the CEO. you got to have a lot of questions for Mel Tucker here because, once again, team not ready to play at all. The game plan, really, really suspect, which we will get to when we dive into the actual game in the second and third segment. But, hey, look, we praise Mel Tucker for what he does in the portal. He's gotten some really good players. Jacoby Winman's a strong player. Hey, Jarrett Horst, you know, fine player last season. Kenneth Walker, good player, but also... What's going on with the guys in the secondary that you got? That that's a swing and a miss. Hey, if we can celebrate your home runs, we're we're gonna we're gonna notice the strikeouts too. And so far, a lot of strikeouts in the secondary. And if only there was someone that could step up and coach the secondary, really take them under their wing. And hold on, who did that this year? Oh, that's Mel Tucker that did that this year. Yeah, Mister, uh, our past defense can't get any worse. I'm gonna take the cornerbacks under my wings. Whoa, Nelly. Okay, Tanner Morgan looked like Joe Burrow in that first half, and things are not looking good. And as you know by now, because, look, you're a Michigan State fan, of course, you know what this is all about. This keeps 
happening. This keeps on happening. Tanner Morgan, 206 passing yards in the first half. Completely inexcusable. But, hey, it's just what we got now. And, look, I, I get that the recruits that you have brought in aren't old enough yet to make an impact. We'll just use that excuse, you know, right now, for example. No excuse for everyone else being this poor, though. Look, we know you utilize a transfer portal. You, you send kids out of the program that aren't up to snuff. You bring kids in that you think can make an impact. This is really bad, though. This is really very, very, very bad that the secondary still looks this atrocious. After all those fun offseason quotes of, hey, it can't get any worse. Uh, oh, I think that it actually can get uh, a little worse here. So, uh, hey, again, I believe in the Mel Tucker era. I think that, well, yeah, recruiting is going to be the only way that Michigan State can get themselves out of this hole right now. So it's going to take some patience here. But also, yeah, coaching in-game before the game, just the preparation. We also got to look at that too. But, yes, recruiting is going to be the staple as it is in every sport in college sports. And Mel Tucker's an ace recruiter. Let's see how much of an ace recruiter, though, because he might have to be recruiting off of a season that ends in a 5-7 and seven record a six and six record, maybe even a seven and five record. If you're feeling yourselves, you know, go to the Duke's Mayo bowl, but we'll get to that in a hot second. I just need to talk your ear off about Scotty Hazleton's future website. He will be hitting hard and that is linkedin.com. That's right. Folks LinkedIn. We already know what the wonderful folks at LinkedIn can do. They can place anyone in any job, just like your company. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. And that is why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team fast and for free. That's right. So add your job, add the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile so that everyone knows that you are indeed hiring. That simple. It really is. It's great. Lockdown, or, sorry. LinkedIn makes everything so easy. Like their screening questions, they make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so that you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. There's no wonder why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps find you the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your jobs for free terms and conditions apply. And before we get back into the postmortem of whatever happened Saturday, uh, Hey, really, I, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much for listening to this here show, giving us a, a try here. If this is your first go around, um, yeah, you guys are truly the best. We do this five days a week here. If you are new, but if you're not, thank you for being a loyal listener. Love all you guys. Um, so yeah, uh, again, we're, we're going to take a little longer of looking at the big picture picture here before getting into what actually happened on Saturday. And I think the bull eligibility questions are completely reasonable. Uh, hey, reactionary a little too far. If you think so, I'm not going to say you're wrong. I'm not, I'm not going to say that, oh, okay, you're an idiot for thinking that. No, everyone's entitled to their own opinion. But look, you're looking at a 2-2 two and two record. And before this game, we had the debate on last week's show if uh, this is a must-win game. And I said, for if not for nothing else, it really shows what the future is going to look like. Because after this game, you got to hit the road to Maryland. Maryland's a decent team. And we just found out that you only have to be a decent team to completely slaughter Michigan State. So good luck in College Park next weekend. Then after that, hey, we're back home, back-to-back -back weekends against Ohio State and Wisconsin. You're looking at going into the bye week if you don't win any of those games at a 2-5 and five record. A 2-5 and five record. Let's say you beat Maryland or you stun Ohio State, but you lose the other two. That's still 3-3 three and three going into the bye week here. No, I'm sorry. That'd be 3-4 and four going into the bye week if I could do my math correctly. After the bye week, okay, you got to go to Michigan. <sighs> I might skip that game. Uh, you got to go to Illinois. And look, Illinois has got a solid offensive line, solid run game. That's pretty much all it takes to beat Michigan State. Uh, then you have Rutgers at home. You have Indiana at home. That's pretty much the only one I'm feeling pretty good about. And then you got to go to Penn State at the end of the year. Find me the four guarantee wins there. I, I, I don't I don't see them anymore. Look, if you lost to Minnesota, you know, kept it close, one possession. Hey, you know, I'm feeling frisky. Maybe if you kept it to two possessions, I'd be feeling a little, maybe somewhat barely okay about the rest of the season. 34-7. Game's over. 
by the time the second quarter rolled around, I don't think that the Maryland game is a guarantee anymore. I don't think the Illinois game on the road after the Michigan game is a guarantee anymore. Maybe Rutgers could be a guarantee, but hey, they stifle people's run game. Indiana at home, that might be the only guarantee you see on your schedule with a lot of maybe not even coin tosses, but leaning losses right now. So, hey, yeah, Mel Tucker, he could recruit. He's awesome, ace recruiter, but I, I fear that we're about to see just how good of a recruiter he is. Hey, all you four stars that I have signed on for the 2023 class, I know that you guys are getting courted you know, by good SEC teams, pretty good Big Ten teams. Maybe Notre Dame wants to get in there. That's a sweet brand name. Still want to come to Michigan State after uh, playing in the Quick Lane Bowl? Why don't you? And again, hey, again, if you think that this is all a little too much, um, we'll revisit this conversation in November as you know, Michigan State goes to Happy Valley with the 5-6 and six record. But hey, I digress. Uh, we will still be here to talk about this team every single day up until that point. So now let's just get into uh, the actual game here. And uh, yeah, I'll say it once again, just another game that's over immediately. Uh, and the, the, what happened on the first few drives really set the tone for the rest of the game. First drive for Minnesota, converted a second and 15. And then, hey, in the red zone, they converted a third and eight. Easy touchdown. Michigan State, once again, just like they did all night in Seattle last week, set up the velvet ropes, rolled out the red carpet and said, how about you guys just score right off the bat and then do it again and then hold on to the ball for a while and do it anyway. First drive for Michigan State. Yeah, that was a good idea trying to establish the run very early on, especially with the running back who had an average carry of what negative yards last week at Washington. The, the running back that seemingly is wearing flip flops out there and can't even stay on his own feet when he gets the ball. Okay, first of all, we need to. What shoes is Michigan State wearing? I've never seen a team slip in four games as much as I've seen Michigan State slip this season, but hey, when. Things ain't going right, things ain't really going right, and that goes down to, well, the, the footwear that you have. Also, just in the first half, 10-plus yard plays. Minnesota had seven of those before 10 minutes even ran off. At halftime, well, hmm, uh, not good. 19 plays, Michigan State ran at halftime. Minnesota had 19 first downs. Minnesota had 14 first downs before you even had one. So, who are we going to talk about first, the defense or the offense? Well, I think the defense is the spicier thing to talk about because if anyone's head is going to be on a uh, proverbial spike here, it's the popular name in the room, the defensive coordinator, the guy making over $1 million to coach defense. What a robbery. Uh, Scotty Hazleton. And, well, okay, we can talk about it all. We can talk about the players. Not – not, 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 not that great, which brings me no joy to say that they're better at football than probably, albeit anything in life. But with that said, still not anywhere close to good enough to be competing in the Big Ten. Last week against Washington, you barely blitzed. You barely applied any pressure. This week, you tried to blitz. The blitz has never got home. And also, when Tanner Morgan slung the ball before the blitz even got home, it's on single coverage, and single coverage was getting burned all game Lawn. So, yes, it's a little bit of everything on the defense. Of course, it's the adult in the room, Scotty Hazleton. That's that's the, the first guy that you got to talk about because this isn't just the fourth game of the 2022 season. This isn't just the second weekend in a row we've seen a mediocre quarterback blitzkrieg Michigan State secondary. Happened all year last year, too. Happened all year last year, too. Last year, six quarterbacks either had their career best day or their second career best day against the Michigan State football Spartans. So that falls on your shoulders, Scotty. Yes, hey, the, the players are trying their best. But my goodness gracious, was there any coaching that went on in the offseason? Was there any work on technique? What, I don't even know what happened in the offseason other than just, hey, hearing that, it can't get any worse. Okay, cool. Yeah, sick. Um, it's And really what is more concerning this year, and it was still a big issue last year, is what happens on third downs. And this was one of the keys to the game that we talked about on Friday is can you get off the field on third down if you're the defense? Minnesota is elite at converting third downs. They're best in the country, but more alarmingly is that Michigan State is really bad and really bad in the worst opportunities as well. Minnesota goes into halftime converting three of six third downs. Well, five of those looked pretty effortless, didn't they? And it's contagious, too. It happened a lot last week against Washington. You know, any time it was third and long, look to my friend next to me and say, hey, that, why is the chain game staying in there? Just go ahead and move and they're going to convert. And more times than not today, 
Uh, I was correct, unfortunately. That's right. Not right a lot of times, but mm, unfortunately, I was right there. And now I start to fear that it's going to get really contagious. And it, it's got to be playing in the defense's head. Because, look, from, from a, a grander scheme of things, we've seen teams lose games contagiously, right? Like, look at last year's Nebraska team. They always choked late in the game. They always kind of had in the back of their heads thinking that, uh-oh, the shoe's about to drop here. Let's just try not to oh, play scared. Oh, no, here we go. Oh, no, and we lost again. That That's like a broad, like a whole game sort of thing. More of a micro thing. I think that this is really going to impact Michigan State mentally on third downs is that when it's third and long, they know the shoe's going to drop. They know that the chains are about to be moved because, wow, has this been an issue the last two weeks, but also a fair amount of times last year. So, yeah, the, the third down defense, what can you do? No, really, do you have an answer? What, what can you do? Can't really blitz properly. Um, and it's not like, you know, Minnesota's offensive line is anything world beating. We'll get to their offensive line and ours in the next segment. Uh, you can't, you know, press coverage. You can't do one on one coverage. It, it's a whole completely broken system. And when it's that broken, yeah, the adults in the room, the ones making pretty good money, like some of the best in the country money, can't be coaching one of the worst pass defenses in the country for the second season in a row. But that's where we are. And uh, how does it get fixed? It doesn't. I don't think it does. I don't know what you could do. You're not going to dip in the transfer portal and find some stud in the fifth week of the season. You're not just going to, you know, change everything that you've been doing the last 20 or so games. So we just got to sit back, watch uh, to his brother light us up for 556 yards next week. And I'll just do this podcast show all over again, talking about, Hey, when are we going to fire Scotty Hazleton? But yeah. Um, when it's this bad, you look at the adults in the room and that's Hazleton. That's Tucker. <laughs> The guy who brought cornerbacks under his wing. There we go. Nice. How's that working? All right. Let's flip it to the offense right now because no shortage of things to talk about for the offense. Uh, and let's start with uh, hey, the other adult in the room, Jay Johnson. And look, I, I, I'm i going to come to his defense a little bit. I'm not going to say, hey, fire Jay Johnson or he's a fraud. But I think that the rest of this season is really a good litmus test for who he really is as a coordinator. The first year – we all know how much that roster struggled, right? That was not a, a complete Big Ten roster, kind of behind the eight ball there. Last season, hey, he looked really good. Then again, a lot of offensive coordinators in the country would look really good if you could just run the, hey, give the ball to Kenneth Walker play uh, more times than not. So now this is a true test of what kind of a coordinator Jay Johnson is. I think he's fine overall, but wow, am I a little concerned about how we started this game? You're down 7-0, just like you were last week. You need a response immediately. What are you doing handing the ball off back-to-back -back times to Jarek Broussard for a grand total of, what, three total yards to get yourself in a third and seven situation? No. no, no, no. First of all, if you're going to establish a run, do it with the running back that actually has some power, some pop behind your offensive line that refuses to open up any lanes in Jalen Berger, not the guy who, again, is wearing Crocs Covered in Crisco every single game. I don't know how he can't stay on his feet. Anyway, so there we have it is just the way you started the game. And I get you want to establish the run because, hey, Peyton Thorne works really well in the play action. You want to get something there. You want Minnesota to think that a run's coming, but you can't. You can't because the offensive line, unfortunately, isn't up to snuff. And this is where the conversation now goes. Don't worry. Hey, I know that a lot of you are thinking, when is he going to start talking about his boy, Peyton Thorne? And we'll get to that at the end of the show, but right now for the second week in a row, the offensive line looked <laughs> not good at all against a Power 5 team. 2.7 yards per carry for Michigan State this week. Never got off the ground. And it really hurts when, again, for the second weekend in a row, you look at the other team's offensive line, and Minnesota replaced four starters from last year. Washington last week had to replace, I think it was three, if not maybe even four stars from last year. And they look just fine compared to yours. And again, we're going to talk to the ADULTS in the room, the adults in the room. And that is another coach making more than one million United States dollars. Uh, that's not that's not a good look. And here's the thing. We talked up and down this offseason about the offensive line, how that's going to be a major concern going into the year but not the starters. We talked about the concern being the depth behind the starters. If someone gets hurt, if two people get hurt, which seems to happen a lot in East Lansing, that what's going to, what's the depth going to be looking like behind those starters? Because, Hey, we feel fine about the starters. 
Wow, was that wrong? Because this is the starting group. You don't have, like every other position group on the field, you don't have the excuse of injuries to hide behind here. There's no reason the offensive line should be this bad. Now, am I going to say, hey, fire uh, Chris Kapilovic. He, he's a trash offensive line coach. I'm not going to go that far because, hey, he also recruits his ass off. Like, look at Michigan State's recruiting for the offensive line coming in. Hope you can keep those guys as you go to a 6-6 six and six record most likely. But, hey, at the end of the day, I don't think it's unfair to ask for more from the offensive line. And, again, they, these kids are working their you-know-what's off. I, when it's this bad, though, you, you have to look at the coaching staff. And I don't think that's necessarily completely unfair. Hey, it's not like he's making a half million dollars, you know, just, you know, middling uh, FCS type money. No, he's one of the few. I think it's like less than a dozen, maybe a little over a dozen non-coordinator coaches that make over a million dollars a year. I don't think that's unfair to ask a little more than just to, hey, have your unit open up a run lane or two uh, for your guys. Maybe protect your quarterback a little bit, but there we have it. And let's get to that quarterback right now because, hey, uh, you guys, if you listen to this podcast, know me. I am uh, I'm a huge Peyton Thorne guy. Big Peyton Thorne. I'm the conductor of the Peyton Thorne hype train. And let me tell you, uh, tracks ran out today. And at the other side of those tracks um, is – a cliff that I still haven't hit the bottom of yet because wow. Wow. Um, again, these kids are trying so hard. You got to give nothing but respect to these kids. Uh, there's, they're, they're students too. You know, uh, they're balancing football work, weight training, the stress, the pressure that they have along with school work. These are hardworking kids. But with that said, okay. Um, I'm starting to get a little worried about Peyton Thorne and maybe the hype train is coming to a slow right now. That was as Bad of a game as you could really ask for him. Uh, the interception in the first half on fourth down. A fourth down, I think he could actually just scampered out of the pocket and gotten the three yards that he needed for the first down. Yeah, that was not good. Uh, he also, hey, Michigan State did one good thing in the first half, and that was force a turnover on a fumble. How do you take advantage of it, offense? Okay, you you, you sail it over your number one target's head, uh, Jaden Reed, who, hey, thanks for coming back, Jaden Reed. Um Sailed it over his head. Easy touchdown, pitch and catch. Hey, these guys are high school teammates. They're best friend. Completely airmailed it over him. That cannot happen. And then, yes, also, it's third and 10, and we're throwing three yard hitch routes. I get it. Minnesota rushed three. You know, they, they had eight people in coverage. You're down 17 points. Sling the rock downfield. What do you think a three yard pickup is going to do on third and 10? It brings the punt unit on the field. I'll just tell you what it does. It brings the punt unit on the field. And then the fumble in the second half. I don't have to tell you this. That That's inexcusable. That's unacceptable. But, hey, here's another secret, too. Didn't matter. The game was already out of reach at that point uh, because uh, Michigan State's defense couldn't stop anyone. The offense couldn't get going. And now, well, uh-oh, hold it. Oh, excuse Oh. What do you mean, Matt? The offense could have get going. Noah Kim scored a touchdown at the end. He's your new starting quarterback. I think I'm going to be in the minority here. And maybe this is delusional. If you think that Noah Kim should be the starting quarterback, I, I would be an idiot to tell you that you're wrong. I would be a clown. A clown to argue against that and say, no, you're being irrational. That's fair because it has been four games this year. Peyton has struggled in three of those games. And ironically enough, all three have been at home. Like, he just can't get comfortable in his home barn. But I still, for at least one more game, think that Peyton Thorne should be the starting quarterback. And that might sound ridiculous. Maybe I'm just a little too high. Maybe I'm just holding on to my Peyton Thorne stock a little too tight. And uh, I just have, you know, an attachment problem and I just don't want to let go. But he got it done last year. For the most part, more times than not, he was a fine player. I know that he does have the weight of the world on his shoulders this year, but now we got to start to think, can he get that out of his head? Because that's probably affecting his play right now. I'm going to give the smart quarterback, the guy who's cerebral, you know, the, the leader of this team. He it was a captain yesterday or today, whenever you're watching the show, I want to give him one more shot here, and if things go really bad in College Park, okay, majority, I, I might start to creep to your side of Noah Kim might be him. Noah Kim might be him. And, hey, look, I, I know that Noah Kim's looks sweet. He's got two touchdowns already this season, but I do think it's a little different coming in as a backup quarterback. 
where there's not a lot of tape against you. And besides, you know, a lot of second string guys are playing against you as well. They'd be in the top guys. So I, I don't think the grass is necessarily that much greener on the other side. But right now, as we're watching the grass on our side, Brown, I want to I, I just water it one more time against Maryland to see if there's anything there to see if we can get a turnaround bounce back game from Thorne, but it's going to take a lot. It's going to take the offensive line to work too. It's going to take the coaches to get the team ready. And uh, quite frankly, I don't know if that happens, but yeah, um, I probably didn't put up a good argument there for why Peyton should uh, keep on starting, but that's just the way I feel. He, he's the experienced guy. He has no starts in the room, obviously. So yeah, he's dug himself out of holes before. This is by far the biggest one he's dug him into. So uh, I would want to give the kid a chance to see if he can dig himself out because what I, I guess why not? Like, as if like there's oh we're still hanging on to like a college football playoff season, or like oh come on, like if we put Kim in, we're right back in the Big Ten title. No, we're, we're not. Like this is a team that's just going to try to get to the Duke's Mayo Bowl. Um, I'd, I'd pay out of pocket to get to the Rayleigh Equest Bowl at this point, but I don't know. It's if you made it this far in the podcast, um, a you're either a, a rival fan that's just eating this up, and why not? This got to be a, this got to be a thrill for you. Uh, or number two, you're like me, you're a sick person, you can't get enough of this team, and you won't stop watching, you won't stop thinking about them, you won't stop talking about them. And uh, if that's you, hey, well, I got good news for you. We will be back four more times this week. Monday through Friday as we build up to the Maryland game. Woo! Go green! Bounce back spot. Hope the teams... Let's just see if we can make a game competitive in the second half. I can't believe I'm saying that coming off of a Peach Bowl win. An 11-win season. A season where I'm just screaming tuck coming. I'm just drunk off the tuck juice. And here, here, here we are. Here we are. Oh, man. Oh, this is horrible. <laughs> oh, I don't know what to say. Uh, all I can do is laugh. I laugh to keep from crying. And that is how we're going to end this show. Guys, I love you all. Even the haters. You guys are great, too. Um, you guys are all the best. Go green. Try to enjoy the rest of your week or your weekend or whatever. Love you all. Let's go. God, go green.